Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Whiteside. I'm BC's Minister of Education, and I would like to acknowledge with respect and gratitude that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional territory of the Lukungwan-speaking people of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. And I'd like to thank Anne Kang, Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Training, and Dr. Bonnie Henry, our Provincial Health Officer, for being here as well. I want to start this morning by extending my heartfelt thanks to teachers, school leaders, support staff, administrators, custodial staff, bus drivers, the students, the parents, the education partners, our rights holders, trustees, advocates, and everyone who supports children in our education system. Your extraordinary work was key to our collective success last year in keeping schools safe and open. We are committed, as we have been from the beginning of this pandemic, to following the science and the direction of public health while working collaboratively with all of our education partners, rights holders, the BC Centre for Disease Control, Dr. Henry and her staff as we navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. I would also like to extend my deep gratitude to our Provincial K-12 Steering Committee, which has been working throughout the summer and indeed for more than a year now to bring us to the point where we are today with the plans for the 2021-2022 school year. I want to just begin with uh, uh, talking a bit about our plan to keep schools open and safe for K-12 students this year. And I, you know, September always brings really special feelings. We know that students and staff are looking forward to the return to school. We know as well that there's some anxiety about what that looks like this year. In June, we announced health and safety guidelines for the coming year and that we would be holding off on determining a policy around mask wearing until we saw how the pandemic changed over the summer. Today, we're confirming that students are returning for full-time in-person learning, supported by a requirement for all K-12 staff, as well as students from grades four and up to wear a mask in indoor spaces, along, of course, with the other health, uh, health and safety measures that will keep students and staff safe. So this means that students can look forward to a resumption of safe, in-person, full-time learning, extracurricular activities, sports, arts, uh, performing arts, and music. We know they're also looking forward to seeing their friends, teachers, librarians, coaches, and all of the other school staff. We are committed to, in, to safe in-class learning, not just for the educational growth of students, but also for their social and emotional well-being. We recognize that COVID is an ever-changing pandemic that will continue to challenge us this year. But we are not in the same situation this year as we were heading into last September, because we now have safe and effective vaccines that we know protect us from COVID. And in the spring, many health authorities made frontline educators and school staff a priority for vaccination. And going into this year, all British Columbians 12 years and older are eligible to receive the vaccine and many in this age group have in fact been receiving vaccinations against COVID-19 all summer. As of this past week, 72% of 12 to 17 year olds in British Columbia have had their first dose and 57% are fully vaccinated. And I want to say to you now, if you are eligible for a vaccine, but you have not yet received your, your, vac your vaccination, now is your time. We know that getting vaccinated is the single most important step we can take to keep students safe this year. We've been working collaboratively with the steering committee uh, and the BC CDC and have revised guidance to update our health and safety guidelines. And I'll just provide a, a brief overview of these guidelines, uh, which uh, we've been working on with all of our partners over the summer. What we announced in June was that we would continue this school year with the foundations of our health and safety guidelines, the daily health check and attendance management, ensuring that students and staff do not come to school while they're sick, ongoing hand hygiene, ensuring that students, uh, uh, the ensuring enhanced cleaning, uh, the, and having in place a health and safety checklist uh, for school administrators. The mask requirement that was in place uh, last spring 
will continue in place to start this upcoming school year. This means all K-12 staff and all students in grade 4 to 12 will wear non-medical masks in all indoor areas of school, including classrooms and school buses. Students in kindergarten to grade 3 will continue to be encouraged to wear masks. Extracurricular activities are allowed in line with any local, regional, provincial, or national health orders in the community. And also, as announced in June, uh, our rapid response teams will continue to work with school districts and health authorities to support local districts and schools with their safety plans. These provincial measures can also be supplemented by regional measures as needed. School medical health officers and the health authorities will continue to be able to introduce local measures in the event of COVID-19 outbreaks or a rising number of infections. And this may include orders aimed at individual schools, groups of schools, or an entire district. And also as announced in June, the guidelines are supported by a $43.6 million uh, a pandemic specific funding, which includes funding to address uh, learning impacts. And I want to just pause a moment to say a word about ventilation because we know that ventilation in schools is very important for the health of students and staff. Between last school year and this upcoming school year, $87.5 million in provincial and federal funding has been invested specifically for air quality improvements in schools. And our government has invested $77.5 million from our province's budget to support numerous air quality projects in school districts. 44 of BC 60 school districts have upgraded, have upgraded their, uh, their HVAC systems. And you know, we have over 1,500 public schools in this province, and 100% of those schools are working on ventilation. And our ministry continues to work with all school districts to ensure all mechanical HVAC systems are designed, operated, and maintained as per standards and specifications to ensure that they're working properly. And I want to highlight just the example, uh, one example of the work that's been underway to support air quality improvements in schools. The Vancouver uh, School Board reports uh, reported to us that their central HVAC and schoolroom ventilation systems have all been upgraded uh, with MERV 13 filters in, in every school in, in their district. And we, we are going to continue to work with districts to ensure they continue to provide clean and safe air for students and staff. I also want to remind everyone that in June we announced an additional $5 million to support pandemic-related mental health programs and services. And school districts are using that funding to maintain mental health programs that they developed last year or to en uh, enhance supports uh, that they have through their, through their regular programming, mental health programming for students. And I want to, uh, I would like to provide a, a special thank you to Minister Sheila Malcolmson and Ministry of Mental Health and Addiction staff for their ongoing support of this important work. If your child uh, needs mental health supports now or leading up to the start of the school year, please visit our Erase Government website. Just Google Erase BC and the, the website come up, at, will come up and that will provide you with immediate links to care. Uh, just in wrapping up, I, I know that educators, principals, superintendents are really looking forward to welcoming students back on September 7th. And we are working hard to make sure that this is a successful return to school. I do want to reinforce that the most important thing we can do right now is to make sure everyone 12 and up who is eligible gets vaccinated. That will help keep students safe. Our education system and everyone in it has been extremely resilient and adaptable over the past 18 months. And I know everyone from educators to staff to trustees have worked so hard to put students first. I really want to thank the educators and everyone who has remained so focused on children as we start the new school year. Thank you so much. And I would uh, now like to introduce Minister Ann Kang, who will speak about health and safety for post-secondary institutions. Thank you, Minister Wyside, and good morning, everyone. It is my honor to join you from the traditional territories of the Ligwankan speaking peoples, known as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, and I thank them for the ability to gather and work on their lands. 
I would also like to begin by acknowledging what a challenging time it has been for students, faculty, and staff at BC's colleges and universities. I am grateful to everyone who has done their part to keep our community safe. And I want to acknowledge how difficult the pandemic has been for students. It has affected your ability to learn, to work, to stay connected with family and friends. The pandemic has affected students, and this fall's plan to return to in-person learning is so important for everyone to come back together safely. I know we can do it. I am grateful because I know that Dr. Henry and her team of public health experts are working hard to ensure the right measures are in place to keep everyone on BC campuses safe as we return to in-person classes. In July, a team of experts released the COVID-19 return to campus plan and guidelines, recognizing that guidelines would require periodic updates to align with evolving pandemic health guidance. We are listening to students, faculty, and staff across the province. I will let Dr. Henry uh, speak to the details, but our close working relationship with the public health has led to two new requirements that will change in-person learning on campus. The guidelines are being updated to reflect the new mask order and the proof of vaccination requirement, in particular for students living in student housing. For campus life, the new provincial proof of vaccination requirement announced yesterday means people must be vaccinated in order to live in student housing, to go to a pub, to go to gym including varsity students, to attend an indoor club meeting like joining a choir. And of course, that same proof of vaccination will also require, uh, be required for activities that can be a big part of student life, like indoor concerts and attending sports events. Colleges and universities may choose to adopt their own vaccine policies or ask for proof of vaccination that go beyond those set out for provincial order, health order. Those that do so should work with public health and will be responsible for doing their own due diligence. The goal is to get more people vaccinated because we know our safety on campus increases when people are vaccinated. If you haven't gotten vaccinated, please do not delay. Book your appointment today and make a positive choice to get vaccinated, protect your community, and continue to play an active role and enjoy the activities that you would with your loved ones. It is a part of ensuring a safe return to campus, and I am confident the new vaccine requirements on campus, the mandatory masks will keep, uh, keep people on campus safe and give students faculty and staff the confidence they need for a successful return to campus. Thank you. And now I would like to invite Dr. Henry to the podium. Dr. Henry. Thank you very much and good morning. So uh, as mentioned, uh, there's a lot of work that has been going on and as, as we've talked about over the last few weeks. Um, and I'd also want to start by thanking all of the, the school communities, our campus faculty, uh, students, and families um, from K to 12 to our post-secondary institutions. We know this has been a long road and we have a ways to go yet. We were, of course, hopeful that we would make it through this summer and with the um, important vaccine uh, progress that we've made in BC that we'd be able to release some of the restrictions that we have had in place over the last few months and years. However, we now know that there is a still a need for certain um, measures to be taken. We faced hard choices, we've made sacrifices and adjusted a new way of life for all of us over this last 18 months. And we've been working hard to ensure that we continue to have safe reopening of schools, post-secondary institutions for all students, faculty, staff, and our families and communities, and to reduce transmission in those areas as much as possible. And today's measures reflect that. While we have made incredible progress in our shared efforts to be vaccinated and to put this pandemic behind us, in the broader community, as you know, we are seeing increased transmission and increasing levels of transmission, particularly among unvaccinated people, as we've talked about, and in part, of course, due to the increased transmissibility of the variant that we're seeing circulating right now, the Delta variant. 
So today I am announcing we are reintroducing a mask requirement across British Columbia for all indoor public spaces. This measure is needed to ensure that these indoor settings are as safe as they can be for all of us as we head into the fall and we spend more time in activities, whether it's school or other activities indoors. So a provincial health officer order will require masks to be worn by all British Columbians 12 years of age and older in many indoor public settings starting tomorrow. So this will include malls, shopping centers, coffee shops, retail and grocery stores, liquor and drug stores, uh, city halls, libraries, community and recreation centers, restaurants, pubs and bars unless you are seated once you're at your table, on public transit, in taxi or ride sharing vehicles, in, in areas of office buildings where services to the public are provided. So this is to, to address those situations where we are in an indoor setting with people who may not yet have been vaccinated. We also are, will uh, cover common areas of sports and fitness centres as well. And as mentioned, common areas of post-secondary institutions and non-profit organisations and in schools for all K-12 visitors, students and staff in grades 4 to 12. This temporary order will be reassessed as the BC vaccine card requirement is fully implemented in certain social and recreational uh, settings as we announced yesterday. We need to continue to do those things that keep us safe and one of those is wearing masks in these indoor settings as rates of transmission in our communities have creeped upwards. As well, using hand hygiene regularly, staying away when we're sick ourselves and keeping a respectful distance from people when we're in public spaces. These are the things that we need to continue to do to get us through this next phase of our pandemic. And we will be continually reassessing and adapting to what this pandemic presents us. I know we all want to put it behind us and I can't stress enough the powerful and effective tools we have that are helping us to do that and that is vaccines. As we've said a number of times, vaccines are the most effective way to keep transmission down, to keep COVID out of our communities, out of our schools, out of our workplaces. And as we know, as many as 75% of, of eligible people in BC have had their two doses of vaccine. And that has made a huge difference in the number of people who require hospitalization, who require additional care. But we still need to do better than that as this virus is changing and we are still at risk. That's why yesterday we took this important step to continue increasing our vaccination rates and ensure that people who are protected are able to safely enjoy uh, some of these recreational activities. By mandating a proof of vaccination to enter some spaces, we will reduce transmission in those spaces, we'll keep our communities safe and we'll be able to keep those important social and business and recreational activities going. The vaccine requirement applies to all students living in on-campus student housing uh, with this requirement in effect starting September 7, but will be phased in to ensure that students have access to vaccines. Public Health is working with post-secondary institutions to ensure that all student staff and faculty have timely access to immunization and we will be working as well with all of the schools to ensure that vaccines are available in schools when, when needed um, but to ensure that all staff and, and students can have easy access to the vaccines that we need. There are walk-in clinics, vax vans, booths at farmers markets, beaches and skate parks and every place else through this summer and that will continue as we move into the fall to make sure that we can protect as many people as possible so that we can continue the good work that we're doing to keep schools and education systems open and to keep our businesses and recreational and social activities going as we make it through this next phase of our pandemic. Thank you and we're happy to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Henry. As a reminder to reporters on the phone line, please press star one to enter the queue. You're limited to one question and one follow-up only. First question today is from Richard Zussman, Global News. There obviously is a lot to process there. Uh, you were pretty, just last week, you were at a BC Lions game uh, not wearing a mask. Now all of a sudden we have a mask mandate province-wide. 
what changed over the last few weeks and how important do you believe the province-wide mask mandate will be in terms of cutting down on transmission of the virus? Yeah, so what we were talking about as we've monitored the things that have been happening through the summer, um, we know that people who are immunized, particularly in outdoor spaces, keeping distance, um, that risk of transmission is very, very low. But we also know that as we move into the fall, we're starting to congregate more in indoor public spaces. And right now, we know that this virus is transmitting in some of those indoor public spaces. So this is an additional measure. We've said all along, masks are one of the additional measures that we need in certain circumstances, particularly when we're in uh, places that may have poor ventilation, where we're around people whose vaccine status we don't yet know. Um, when we're in those situations where uh, we can be um, in close contact with others over a period of time. So that's what this is going to do. It's really, uh, we've heard from many, many people about the importance of continuing to, to pay attention to these basic measures in our communities, in those public spaces. This is a different situation than we were in last year, where we didn't have immunization, and we now have plans in workplaces and other settings where we saw a lot of transmission. So it is addressing this uh, specific risk as we move into the fall, into respiratory season, in those settings where we can't control our environment as well. Richard, do you have a follow-up? Again, we're just processing some of this information. So I'm trying to understand around um, vaccine requirements. Uh, why no vaccine requirements in the K-12 system uh, in terms of uh, students uh, who can be immunized or administrators? Uh, and can you walk through, uh, again, I know you mentioned some of this, but we were, I was trying to process the mask policy um, about uh, immunization on campuses, what, what those requirements will look like. And for K-12, to will there still be notices going home uh, in terms of whether uh, when there are uh, COVID events uh, that occur in the school setting? Um, so I'll turn it over to the minister to answer some of those questions. But uh, yes, we are encouraging, of course, all people who work in the education sector um, and all uh, children 12 to 17 who are eligible for vaccination to be immunized. And we're supporting that through uh, clinics that we'll be having with uh, schools and in communities. And what we are seeing is that vaccination rates in school settings reflect the communities that those schools are in. So we'll be working um, as our, our ground game, as, as Dr. Ballum calls it, to make sure that we're making a uh, vaccine available to people in those settings. And, uh, you know, this is one of those things where um, there are a whole bunch of different factors that are in play around uh, vaccine mandates. And we've talked about this a little bit about uh, where it is um, an important difference and uh, uh, outcomes are at, uh, at risk, if you will. So the measures that we introduce, for example, are mandatory immunization for people who work in long-term care. That is because we know that once uh, the virus is introduced in a long-term care setting, even fully vaccinated elderly seniors um, may become infected and can be uh, lethally affected by this virus. And we saw this over the weekend where we had 10 people in long-term care uh, uh, succumb to COVID. So it is really important that everybody who works in long-term care be immunized. It's important that healthcare workers are immunized so that we can protect each other and stay healthy and also protect the people that we care for. So the mask uh, the immunization mandates are very important and those are the things that we're working on in those settings. When we talk about uh, post-secondary, I will say that there is a requirement for health sciences students to be immunized because we know that they are required to do uh, practicums and other uh, training set in uh, healthcare settings, including long-term care. So we're working with uh, the health sciences sector to make sure that um, students are aware of the requirements for them to be immunized in those settings. And maybe I'll turn it over to Minister Whiteside. 
Thank you, Dr. Henry, uh, and thanks for thanks for the question, Richard. Uh, with respect to uh, to vaccinations in K to 12, uh, I, I just want to say uh, that I am so grateful for the work that our uh, our partners uh, continue to do to uh, to encourage high rates of vaccination. The BCTF, the uh, QP, uh, the school trustees, all of our education partners have been sending the same message about the importance of being vaccinated. And we saw in this in the spring when vaccine became available for uh, for school-based staff in Surrey as part of uh, our response to uh, the situation that we were in in Surrey with the, in, in the third wave that there was very high uptake uh, amongst amongst school staff um, to, to, to get the vaccination so you know we're, we're, we're confident that we're that in k-12 there is uh, there, that we are uh, all of our partners are on the same page about the importance of, of vaccination um, I, I think that we can look at the numbers as well uh, for the 12 to 17 cohort where we see a uh, really dr dramatic uptake of, of vaccinations. We've got some, you know, a, some, a, a further uh, ways to go uh, yet. Remember, those vaccines have been uh, been available for that age group since just the end the end of the school year. And I know that Dr. Ballam and her team are working with uh, with our ministry, with uh, with school districts, on ways to reach out to uh, to that uh, to that cohort leading up to September and through September to increase those uh, those, those vaccinations uh, those vaccination rates so there there is a there is a concerted effort across um, across our sector in in that regard and I'm sorry Richard did I miss another part of your question it was about um, whether we're going to get the notices that that came that that was the last part of the question about whether the there still will be notices when there are COVID cases uh, in the school setting. Yeah, and, and that's a part of our plan that we're still working through with the BCCDC. We're, we're waiting for the uh, for the BCCDC to uh, to work through what their notification um, process will be um, for the uh, for going into the school year, and then we will work with uh, with districts to 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 essentially implement that. But it's really a a decision that comes from public health about how to notify um, in, uh, individuals uh, who may be affected by. By a, uh, by a communicable disease. And so that um, we, we will certainly have a, a confirmation of, the, of, of what people can expect in that regard uh, in advance of the start of school on September 7th. Next question is from Maria Weisgerber, CTV. Well, hi there, thanks for taking my question. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, learning groups or cohorts uh, in school for um, K to 12. Uh, are those going to be in effect again for the 2021-2022 school season? Uh, and if not, why not uh, continue to keep, um, try to keep students and teachers um, in select groups? Thank you for that. And as we'd announced in June, uh, there will not be cohorts or, or learning uh, groups um, uh, applied in, in K to 12 this uh, going into the school year. Um, what we have, uh, what we are, have focused on, and what we know parents and students are really looking forward to, is full-time in-person learning. Uh, and so we uh, we signaled to the uh, to the to the sector in in June that they should plan for uh, for timetables that reflect that reflect that that approach. And again, we are not in the same position now coming into this school year as we were last year. We have vaccines. We have very high uptake uh, with respect to vaccines, uh, and, and, and we know that the best place for children to be learning is in in schools with all of the supports uh, that are there. And so that that is uh, why there are a number of other measures in place um, to, to ensure school safety this year. Maria, do you have a follow up? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, relating to uh, post-secondary students, uh, I want to get a little more clarification about uh, student housing. Um, why? Uh, what will happen with uh, students who uh, are not yet vaccinated, who have secured uh, uh, housing in student residence, which is uh, notoriously pretty hard to get on some campuses? And why is that vaccination uh, requirement also not extended to classrooms on campus? Mr. King. 
Thank you for that question. Um, so in terms of um, students being in uh, student housing, um, the details are being worked out at this moment and we will be working with uh, colleges, institutes and universities that provide student housing um, to, to have more information in the days to come. Um, in terms of having students in uh, classrooms, there will be a mask mandate and uh, students will be protected that way. Um, and um, I'm going to actually pivot to Dr. Henry to uh, talk about um, the different settings of classrooms and uh, places where we will be uh, mandating masks and different uh, vaccinations. Yeah, as, as she indicated, uh, as Minister indicated, uh, we have a number of places around uh, campus where masks will be included and uh, they are working through that with advanced ed. I will say that we know that the in-classroom setting is not the risky setting and it's incredibly important that we don't put barriers in place for people receiving education and that includes post-secondary education. So it is a balancing that we have had of where the risk is and the risk really is in communal living settings that we have seen transmission um, particularly uh, of COVID and that's why we're focusing on uh, the increased in the importance of immunization in those settings and other classroom settings while we didn't have a lot of any <laughs> in many cases in classroom learning in post-secondary last year we've learned a lot from what happened in K-12 to and we know that the in classroom setting is the least of the risky settings so there are other measures in place including having things like assigned seating making sure that people are wearing masks when uh, required, etc. So uh, we don't believe there's a need for a vaccine mandate for students to receive in-class education in post-secondary uh, institutions. With the exception, as I mentioned, of the importance of, of uh, health sciences students who will be doing practicums and providing care in healthcare settings. Joel Ballard, CBC. Hello, thank you. Um, all right, so my first question is for uh, Minister Whiteside. Um, why aren't students in kindergarten to grade three required to wear masks in indoor spaces, given that they can't be vaccinated yet? And I, I imagine most kids at this point are, are used to wearing masks right now. Uh, I will turn it over to the minister, but just to, to start with, the most important thing we can do to protect children who are not yet eligible for vaccines, and we do hope there will be vaccines, particularly for the, the six to 12 year age group by uh, sometime this fall. Um, but the most important thing we can do to protect them is to make sure that the adults around them are immunized, whether that's parents, guardians, the school setting as well. So it is important for us to do that. We know that there are challenges for young people in wearing masks and our approach will continue to be that supportive, positive mask encouraging environment in, with the younger students. Thank you, Dr. Henry. And, and yes, pr precisely, we, we know that, um, uh, that there's been much effort to create positive mask, uh, mask wearing uh, cu cult uh, culture uh, across, um, across our school system. And the gu mask guidelines that we are um, implementing for this September mirror those that were in place uh, at the end of the school year, the last school year. So they are, they are uh, the, it's, a, it's a procedure, it's a set of, uh, of requirements that, that everybody in our, in our school system is, is familiar with. We will continue to encourage uh, younger children to, to, wear, uh, to, to wear masks and um, continue to encourage the, the creation of that, um, of that strong mask wearing culture. And again, just to uh, reiterate also what uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Henry's uh, advice with respect to, uh, to vaccination. We're not in the same place now that we were heading into the last school year. Uh, we have uh, vaccines and we have very high uptake um, in our in school setting and in the in the in the, in the age uh, in the 12 to 17 age range. We have more uh, more to do, uh, but we the best way really for everyone to protect children who cannot yet be vaccinated is to get vaccinated. So I will say again, please, if you have not yet had your vaccination, now is your time. That is the best way to protect children in our schools. Joel, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, I do. When it comes to ventilation improvements in schools, 
what measures are being taken to improve airflow and quality in portables since uh, so many of our schools here in BC use portables? Yes, th thank you for that. And uh, there, uh, there, there is no question that ventilation has been uh, has been a, a priority, particularly since the beginning of the pandemic. There have been significant investments, over eighty-seven million dollars, in the last two years to improve the air quality in our schools. With respect to portables, in fact, many portables have their own. Uh, they're, they're, separate, they're, they're separate buildings, in effect, and have their own vent ventilation systems. We have been working uh, directly with uh, the BCTF, with superintendents, with, with school districts, to identify those areas, those uh, schools or uh, specific classrooms where there may be ventilation problems. And as I indicated, 100% of, um, of, of schools have been, uh, of districts are reviewing uh, the situation with respect to ventilation. And there are very few instances where uh, uh, there need to be mitigating um, uh, approaches such as HEPA filters. I can say, for example, uh, in the case of the Abbotsford School District, they invested in purchasing 176 help HEPA, portable HEPA filters uh, and deployed those uh, HEPA filter uh, air cleaners and deployed those in uh, in classrooms in Abbotsford last year. And we uh, are, are going to continue to work uh, with districts to support those efforts uh, to ensure that, uh, that, that air is safe uh, for students and staff in our schools. Next question is from Lisa Usda, News 1130. Hello, Minister Whiteside and Dr. Henry. Throughout this conference, you've been saying that the best way to protect children who cannot be vaccinated is to have the adults vaccinated. So I really don't understand, especially coming on the teachers last year, asking for every single step possible to keep them safe. Why are we not mandating vaccines for everyone working in a school to ensure that children who cannot be vaccinated have maximum protection around them. Well, maybe perhaps I'll, I'll start and then uh, hand, hand it over to Dr. Henry. I, I, I think, Lisa, that we um, we have seen significant uptake of vaccines uh, amongst school staff. We saw uh, in the Surrey School District, which was the epicenter in the in, in the spring for for COVID in the province, um, uh, very high rates of, um, of of uptake around vaccinations as soon as they were available. And we, of course, saw exposure notifications in schools drop right off after uh, after those those vaccinations were delivered to, to school staff. So we, we are going to continue to work with Dr. Ballum and her team and public health and, 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 and school districts to ensure that, uh, that, that vaccines are available and that we have a, and, and that we reinforce the strong message we have across all of our partner groups in, in education about the importance of vaccination. That is going to be uh, the, the, the focus of what we do over the next, uh, over the coming weeks. Lisa, do you have a follow up? Sure, I was, I was hoping Dr. Henry would answer that as well. But and also, Do Terry Mooring just said there was only 80% of teachers that had vaccinated. But moving on, um, adding this max mandate, which Dr. Henry, you know, from the history, it sort of seems this is sort of your last line of defense that you put in, and putting this in on top of the impending proof of vaccine card coming in. I'm just wondering how bad is the situation going to get this fall and winter with COVID, with these two, you know, intense measures coming in at the same time. Back to you. Maybe you can just take pick, take up on the vaccine question for her as well. Yeah, so, just talking about the the vaccine mandates, um, and I've said this a number of times. It's proportional to the risk. And we know that uh, schools are safe setting, that uh, the risk of transmission in the school settings is actually very low, even in the absence of vaccines last year. So absolutely, um, I believe that we should be um, encouraging, making sure it's available, and then looking at what are the, uh, the things that need to be in place to make sure that every adult who can be immunized in a school setting is immunized, or every eligible person, but particularly the adult in the school settings. So uh, those, uh, there are many things still on the table that we will be looking at as we go through this next few uh, weeks and months. Um, it's hard to say what is going to happen over the, over the fall. Obviously, uh, we're watching the, the case rates. We're looking at transmission in certain communities, particularly where there are pockets of people with low or unva um, uh, who are 
under or unvaccinated. And those are the, the issues that we'll need to continue to address as we go through the next few months. The mask mandate is one of those additional layers that we're putting in place as we transition through the fall. And we'll be watching, uh, we'll be watching whether uh, influenza comes again this year, whether we have other respiratory viruses that they're starting to see in other places. So these are all things that we are adapting and changing as we're going through this pandemic. And in the face of, of high immunization rates, the risk is different. And you know we've seen some modeling. We have modeling that we've been doing in BCCDC. And the things that are, are helpful is there are many different models and modeling groups around the, the country and the province. And they all have slightly different things, uh, outcomes. But what they tell us are some of the important things. And one of the important, most important indicators for stopping transmission as we're heading into a season where we know respiratory viruses, including COVID, spread more easily, is to increase immunization rates across the board. And uh, we, we know that, uh, that even a 10% increase per age group makes a big difference in blunting the impact of uh, even the Delta variant that we're seeing being transmitted right now. So those are all things that we're focusing on right now. We're looking at adapting the measures regionally, as you know, um, where we're seeing pockets of high transmission, and we'll be continuing to do that in the next few months. But right now, these are the measures that we think are important to take us through uh, the BC vaccine card and the um, initiative to try and, in, and ensure that we can have continued safe um, uh, activities over the next couple of months and uh, those indoor public spaces, um, making sure that we're protecting people in those spaces right now too. So it's, um, it's a learning process and we're adapting and learning as, uh, as we're following the epidemiology and watching what's happening. Mike Hager, Global Mail. Thanks for taking my question. Um, so Minister Kang said the responsibility for doing due diligence for any post-secondary school that wants to go beyond a mask mandate will be up to them. Uh, does this mean that universities that want vaccinations and testing requirements will be on their own to figure out how to police that and um, either require students to pay for their own testing or pay for it themselves? And is the province kind of leaving universities on their own to work out those expensive logistics? No, I, I think uh, there was, um, perhaps that wasn't as clear as it should be. Um, we have been working with the post-secondary institutions across the province to have a consistent approach to how we're managing uh, the COVID activities and the, the uh, measures put in place to prevent transmission in campus settings, but to ensure that those important educational opportunities are available for young people. And it, it really has been um, the most difficult time for people, uh, young people who started university in the past year and a half, who graduated from, from high school. And the experience we heard across the board last year was, was very challenging. So these are the measures to put in place to try and, and to ensure we can get back to that all important in-campus learning that is needed for young people across the province. So we have standards, as we uh, talked about. Um, there'll be mask wearing in uh, public indoor settings, including in the classroom and laboratory settings. There's requirements for the vaccine, uh, the BC vaccine card, uh, access to some of the social activities and sporting activities, etc., which will help uh, manage those situations on campus. Um, where I believe the minister was referring to, and I'll turn it over to her, was um, some of the, the discussions around in, uh, staff and faculty in uh, post-secondary institutions and whether uh, the discussion that we just had about K-12, whether there uh, needs to be a vaccine mandate and what that would look like for staff and faculty. And those are the ongoing discussions that are happening at uh, universities, uh, uh, post-secondary institutions across the province, and we're supporting those discussions um, as, a, as one of the functions that uh, will lead us into the fall.
Thank you. And our priority is, um, has always been to continue um, to be the health and safety of students returning to campus. And I know many staff, faculty, and students are quite anxious in coming back to in-person learning after 18 months of being away and learning virtually. And um, this uh, initial approach has, has kept post-secondary students and faculty uh, safe. Um, but in, a, in answering your question, uh, like many other businesses in, as in organizations, post-secondary institutions can uh, make their own decisions on vaccination policy for other settings um, and, and the previous settings we've mentioned as Dr. Bonnie Henry has mentioned uh, places like uh, ticketed events, uh, sporting events, high intensity events, restaurants and pubs, clubs such as um, joining choirs but um, to uh, augment um, vaccination policy for different sections, uh, settings, uh, that's a decision that uh, the uh, post-secondary institutions will be making on their own and um, they, they would be doing their own due diligence and working with public health on that. And um, so this approach ensures that there's a baseline that's consistently uh, consistent across all colleges, universities, and uh, universities, while also respecting their autonomy. Um, I do want to encourage those that have not gotten their vaccination yet to not delay and book their appointments today. Uh, we want to make sure that as we plan to return to on-campus learning, that opportunities are there for all students to enjoy all aspects of a student life and campus life. Mike, do you have a follow-up? Of course I do. Um, sorry, so can you just clarify how many uh, post-secondary institutions are contemplating that, that next step of requiring vaccines of, of students and faculty and staff? And then, Mr. Whiteside, uh, you said that uptake's very high in Surrey specifically. has. Have any districts dipped below, say, 90% in, in vaccination among uh, teachers, staff, and administrators? And if uptake's so high, why not just make it mandatory? Uh, I don't think we, we've got a real explanation of why not just take it that next step. Thank you. I'll answer the first part and pass it to Minister Whiteside after. Um, so the guidelines now are being updated to reflect uh, the new mask order and the proof of vaccine requirements. And um, if uh, institutions such as colleges, institutes, and, and universities would like to um, make their own decisions on vaccination policy for other settings, they may do that at, uh, at their own um, and do their own due diligence, but also work with uh, public health on that. Uh, hi, Mike. I, I, with respect to, uh, to to vaccines in, in education, I uh, we we don't track. I have a mechanism for tracking uh, numbers, uh, sort of by by occupation. I mean, we we track the uh, public health tracks, uh, and, and Dr. Ballum's team is tracking. Uh, uh, the CDC is tracking the the numbers by uh, by age tranche. Uh, we. Uh, are, are basing our, our assessment, though, on, our, on the experience that we've had and on the, the calls that we've had, the extraordinary work that's been done across the K-12 sector all throughout the, since the beginning of the pandemic and throughout last year uh, to keep schools safe. There's been enormous focus on school safety. So, uh, so uh, I, we can tell based on the uptake in uh, vaccinations of school staff in Surrey last when they became available for uh, school staff in Surrey uh, at the end, uh, in, in April last year uh, and the repeated uh, calls of our partners, uh, BCTF, QP, school trustees, all uh, encouraging uh, everyone in their respective school communities to, to be vaccinated. I think as Dr. Henry said, um, we're, we're going at this one, one step at a time. Uh, we have uh, many uh, uh, efforts being put in place uh, through Dr. Ballum's team right now to focus on vaccination, uh, particularly amongst 12 to 17 year olds, in addition to um, uh, vac uh, you know, addressing vac vaccine rates uh, in other communities. So uh, this is something that's going to be monitored very, very closely. We are working very collaboratively, uh, and we will keep doing that work uh, to ensure that we have a safe uh, start to school this year. Last question this morning comes from Christopher Folds, Kamloops this week. Hi, thanks for taking my call. I'm just, uh, I'm thoroughly confused here. Can I just get a simple question or answer? Because the, the answers to Mike's questions confused me. Maybe it's just me. Uh, can a university like Thompson Rivers and Kamloops require vaccination for students and staff on their own 
or not. I apologize for the confusion. The short answer is for students, no. We have a, we have a public health policy. We have uh, measures in place where we think it is important for students is in the communal living settings. So that's the baseline that we have put in place. Whether post-secondary institutions want to have a policy around faculty and staff as an employer, that is where they have some leeway to do that on their own with advice from public health. So we are working with them on those issues. And I, I think we need, again, to put it into perspective. It is the consequences of somebody not being vaccinated, right? And in a healthcare setting, those consequences can be quite dire. People can have severe illness, people can die. So that means uh, we have put in very strict measures for people who work in long-term care. When we're looking at educational settings, especially post-secondary institutions, the risk is not the same. So yes, they may want to uh, look at the employer-employee relationship, and there's, as you know, a lot of other factors that need to be taken into account. Um, whether mass, uh, whether uh, immunization is required, or whether there's alternatives, and for healthcare, the alternative is um, you cannot work in long-term care. Uh, that would be not proportional to risk in a setting like a, a post-secondary institution. So they need to work out with faculty, with staff. Would that mean that uh, faculty or staff who are not immunized would need to wear masks, would need to have periodic testing? Those are employer-employee relationship issues that each post-secondary institution needs to work through. Does that clarify it a bit? Yes, thank you. That does clarify it. Sure. Do you have a follow-up, Chris? I do. One last one for Minister Whiteside, and it's um, she mentioned uh, with all the pro all the all the rules and procedures. She mentioned public schools. Do those does all this also apply to private schools? Uh, easy question. Indeed, it does. Yes, our uh, our, uh, our our guidance for uh, for public schools is is absolutely extended to uh, to independent schools in British Columbia, and we again work very closely with our colleagues in uh, in the independent independent school sector on on this issue. They're a part of our provincial steering committee. So yes, that's all the time we have. Thanks for joining us.